Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle, which is coming right up. And today I have two very special guests for you, two men that I think you will find captivating and exciting. They are Amitai Etzioni of the George Washington University, one of our premier public intellectuals. And I'm very glad to say that today we're joined by Vali Nasser, who's the Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Again, a big force. They've both written books, books that are worth reading. Uh, Amitai Etzioni says, Hot Spots, American Foreign, foreign Policy in a Post-Human Rights World. And the hot book of the moment, is The Dispensable Nation, if you're into these big topics, American Foreign Policy in Retreat by Valley Nasser. And uh, we will be right back. But first, I'd like to do a shout out for our friends at the American Guest House here in Washington. It is a delectable place to stay, comfortable beds, lovely rooms, old-fashioned furnishings, and really superb service. Uh, guest house is a better title than bed and breakfast. Uh, I stay there when I have to, and we put our guests there because it is a very special address in Washington and very central at 2005 Columbia Road. Check it out on the web, American Guest House in Washington, or send them an email at info at americanguesthouse.com. I will be back with fascinating conversation with our guests, and of course, I will be joined by Linda Gasparello, my co-host on this program. White House Chronicle is produced in collaboration with WHUT, Howard University Television. And now, the program host, nationally syndicated columnist Llewellyn King, and co-host Linda Gasparello. Hello again, and thank you for coming along. I'm joined, of course, uh, by Linda Gasparello, as I said, uh, always defending the right of women to wear hats in a hatless age. Nice to see you. Nice she does have, you. by the way, a wonderful head of hair. Uh, <laughs> she's not having medical treatment or anything, which some people think when they see you wearing a hat these days. And, of course, by Amitai Etzioni, frequent guest on this program, and our very special guest, uh, Valley Nasa, Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. What is the thrust of your book? And I'm going to use the television familiar form of first name, Valley. Well, the, the main argument... Of you the, can call me Llewellyn, too. Llewellyn, the main uh, argument of the book is that uh, uh, we are very focused these days, obviously, on problems of the home uh, front, uh, budget crisis, a domestic agenda by, by the president. But this we have uh, uh, decided that as we focus at home, we're going to reduce our attention on the world. And this is most obvious in the case of the Middle East, uh, where, as it turns out, there's actually need for greater American attention and show of global leadership because of the Arab Spring, because of the situation in Syria. And I think we are at a very interesting time in, in our uh, global presence where the signal we're sending to the world is that we really don't want to lead frontally. We don't want to be the one that convenes and shows a direction for, for the global community to address global challenges. And we actually actively would like to reduce the importance of the Middle East in our global thinking and reduce its importance in global politics. And that's a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing largely because I don't think the world is really ready for the, for the United States all of a sudden unilaterally deciding to withdraw. And the shape of the crises or opportunities in the Middle East are too momentous and historic for us to assume that we can just wash our hands off of it and then we would be immune from the blowback. But this raises the question that uh, uh, what do we do? I mean, is, uh, Syria is the case in point. What do we do? Uh, how would we intervene? And how would we intervene in a part of the world where there are long memories and where past interventions have been fairly chaotic and not very successful? Well, they'd be more successful than, than, than uh, at, at different points than not. 
And, uh, and I think it's very easy to hide behind this issue. That well, well, give we, me an example of a successful Middle East intervention by the U.S. Well, you know, you could look at the, the first Iraq war, you could look at the Madrid conference, you could look at the Oslo peace process, you could look at even the stabilizing role the United States has played in, in, in the Persian Gulf, uh, even during the height of the Iran-Iraq war and then aftermath of it. You know, they may not be spectacular successes, but, but had we not been there, uh, had we not intervened, had we let events in the region go their own way, uh, they could have been much more catastrophic. Uh, and yes, we have had cases of bad foreign policy, like uh, overreach in Iraq. But I think we cannot afford to say that, that, well, because in the past we made a mistake, because it's too difficult, somehow uh, we could just be insouciant about this and let it you know, take its own course. It's going to come back and bite us. Amitai, what do you think? Well, first of all, I, I must say, I, I hope everybody who's following you in the program will read this book uh, by my colleague, The, in, the Dispensable Nation. It's, first of all, a courageous book, mm -hmm. because I think after this book, he will not be invited anymore for dinners in the White House. It's quite, quite... I haven't got uh, an invitation uh, since Clinton, uh, so don't uh, worry about it. Uh, it's fine, there's plenty uh, of restaurants. No, but it, 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 it takes uh, somebody who is active in foreign policy uh, to at uh, this early in the administration to say I'm going to call them the way I see them uh, and deserve some recognition. Uh, I happen uh, to uh, agree with him as I uh, spelled out on a hot spot on one major issue and differ with him quite a bit on the, another one. I very much agree that we cannot at this point leave the Middle East. Uh, he, he just wants it still. Uh, we need one way or the other to decide what to do about Iran's nuclear weapons. We need to deal with Syria. And the whole region is in turmoil and change. Uh, and on the other side of the ocean, China will wait. The, the notion that this is the time we have to really uh, suit up and deal with China, especially militarily, uh, it's just uh, there is just no evidence that as Russia, China has huge amounts of difficulties and such. But let me go back to the Middle East, the, where we differ is, uh, and again, it's difficult for me to differ with him. He's not, not only such a it's nice very guy. easy for me. I, I understand that. But you see, he's such a, a sweet, <laughs> but I don't say naive, that's a terrible term, but he's such an optimist. And so when it comes to uh, what he wants to do in the Middle East, he basically wants to rely on economic means instead of military means. And he sometimes sounds like he wants to bring a Marshall Plan. And, he, and in effect, uh, somewhere on page 170, he talks about we should do uh, for the Middle East what we did in Europe, what we did in Latin America, all what we did in Asia. the solutions, including, mm -hmm. if I might say, an essay of yours I just mm -hmm. read about Syria, suggest very complex things, a lot of moving parts. But nations don't implement things with a lot of moving parts well, particularly democracies. What do you think, Linda? Well, I think You're that... You're an old Middle Eastern hand. I think yeah. that... Did you have a bigger hat in the Middle East? <laughs> Maybe. Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. But I think the Obama administration has been a disappointment. Um, it, it started off with the idea, at least diplomatically, that we were going to extend this hand if, mm. if a fist was unclenched. I don't think we went... For, we never really tested that very much. Um, we sort of almost half-heartedly extended the hand, and then we withdrew it immediately. I think that a lot more could have been done, a lot more could have been done with Iran, for instance. I think we had an opportunity uh, where there was a period of, of goodwill to extend that hand more to Iran, and we, we might have a somewhat different, a, a different outcome that we have right now, had we done right. that. Well, I, I think actually Amitai's point is very important about taking complexity very seriously. And this is a very complex region, which is actually exactly why we cannot uh, just assume that we can uh, withdraw from it and not be impacted by its outcome. Uh, you know, our economic engagement or a Marshall Plan uh, is not a guarantee, not in every country. But looking at it the other way around is that we don't have any case of successful democratization in recent waves that we've seen in Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, that has not included economic reform and American leadership and, 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 and engagement. So there are many things that, and I agree with them, there are many things that differentiates Eastern Europe from the Middle East, from promise of NATO to 
history of communism or Southeast Asia or Latin America from the Middle East. But also one big factor when historically we look back at this period 10 years, 20 years from now, is going to be the degree of American enthusiasm and presence and the degree of particularly economic effort to change the economic reality of the region quickly. And, and that's going to be a factor among many other factors that we would put, including anti-Americanism, our legacy, Israel. But, but you, you're asking a lot of different things here. You're asking a, a certain uh, fortitude in the American electorate. You're asking us to fix economies when we're having great difficulty no, no, in no, fixing I'm, our I'm, own No, economies. no, I'm not asking us to fix economies. There is a path. We, we don't need to invent the wheel. We need to, you, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the, the Egypt was negotiating with the IMF just weeks ago over a $5.8 billion package as a result of which Egypt would agree to do certain economic reforms that are vital to turn the economy around. Right. And these are vital because between 2011, when Mubarak left, and today, there are a million more Egyptians that are unemployed. And Egypt needs to come up with economic growth from somewhere. Just when the IMF team was in, in uh, Cairo, or about to arrive in Cairo, Qatar and Libya announced a $5 billion assistance package to Egypt with no strings attached about economic reform, and it killed the IMF deal. But, and but, we had, you know, that's the kind of American leadership. It didn't require our pocket money, but even somebody calling the, the, the Libyans and the Qataris and say, make your money conditional on their signing, or, you know, something of that sort doesn't require ta American taxpayer to be putting up money. But you see, the, let's look at the number one industry which Egypt has, which is obviously tourism. Now, why is tourism falling down? Because there's not elementary security. That's five, right. Five or ten or twenty billions will, will not secure the streets. Second, because tourism has been told... They may not implement it, but that's what I mean. Told they'll have to married unmarried couples will not be able to no, be so in the same true, home. Absolutely. I know it's not true. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely, all is true. And, and, all is true. And, and yeah, alcohol, yeah. they cannot drink alcohol. They have to have segregated beaches. So these are these are the kind of issues. In the other countries in which development succeeded, first of all, first of all, there was cessation of hostilities. There, there were no insurgencies. There were no. Uh, uh, demonstrations and such in any, uh, not in Germany after occupation, during the Marshall Plan, not in Japan, not in Poland, or the other country you mentioned, Argentina. So first of all, security is the first thing. And th even there, the question is, how can we help them to just uh, restore? Right. S uh, second, uh, the question is, when we pour money into countries, the countries which did best, the so-called Asian tigers, uh, China, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, got extremely little foreign aid. Uh, they did it largely on their own. Right. Uh, the country, because most of the aid in sub-Sahara didn't do very well until recently. But uh, let me ask you a question on which I know you have particularly important things to say. Some people argue, from Max Weber on, that not all cultures are equally hospitable to modernization. The, the, there's not, the argument is not that there's something wrong with them mm -hmm. biologically or they're innately un, unable, mm -hmm. but some are more hostile than others to, to capitalism and to democratization. Is the Middle East not different from this viewpoint? It, it could be. I mean, uh, uh, in Middle East, even, even if we don't look at it culture, you could say even historically in terms of political development, security mm -hmm. may not be ready to be Singapore. But, uh, the, um, uh, but ultimately, if there is a force for modernization and stability, I believe has to come from economic reform. Um, you have to put these countries on a path of getting integrated into the global economy. And I agree, I take all of your points about Egypt, but the reality of Egypt is for Egypt to avoid a fate like Pakistan or much worse, it has to be growing at double digit numbers for over a decade. And this growth has to come from somewhere. I mean, tourism is important, but you have to create an environment that reduces public debt, you know, and, and all of these are things that we could have been much more engaged in. Well, is We're there... going to take a little oh, moment here for station identification, primarily for our listeners on Sirius XM Radio, Channel 124. You are listening to White House Chronicle coming to you from Washington, D.C., with myself, Llewellyn King, Linda Gasparello, my co-host, 
uh, our regular uh, frequent guest, Amitai Etzioni of the George Washington University, and today a very special guest, Vali Nasa, the Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. This program can be seen around the globe on the English language stations of the Voice of America and on about 200 U.S. television stations, public and uh, public and educational government stations. Linda. I, just back to Amitai's mm -hmm. point, um, one of the perennial problems I think in the Middle East is can you be, can you modernize without being westernized? And I think the Middle East has really struggled with that and is struggling now with Islamic regimes. They, many, I think, the, I think the, the Brotherhood wants modernization, but they don't want westernization. Can you separate the two yeah, that's in the Turkey future? Comes in. That's where Turkey comes in. Exactly. But, 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 you know, I think uh, we, we can get into an academic debate as to whether this is done or not. But in practice, you have to see what is the force outside of a debate that would push them in that, in that direction. So, you know, if you looked at Prime Minister Erdogan, right. you know, he was a hot-headed fundamentalist. I remember when he first became the mayor of Istanbul, his first thoughts was about segregating the buses and the trams, that. building a huge mosque in the middle of, of, uh, of Istanbul and opening Hagia Sophia back into a mosque. And, and then look at him today. So, uh, you know, either he, he had a moment when he slept one night and woke up <laughs> dreaming of Weber and, and woke up in the I morning. I know he was dreaming of Weber. He might have been <laughs> dreaming of that at all. No, 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 he, no, no, it was actually business. Yeah. I mean, when you go to the small business towns in Turkey that were opened up after economic restructuring that was pushed by the IMF, these businessmen, much like Middletown America, are conservative, religious, but capitalist. Yeah. And they figured out that, um, you know, if you're selling uh, uh, directly, and the government's no longer in the middle because this is now a free economy, if you're selling leather to Ferragamo in Milan, Jihad is not good for business. So, uh, uh, so let, let me. Ask so, so, you know, the, the, the point is that the point is that. But how did these businessmen, you know, begin to sort of self-correct? Uh, and and that's not about this sort of a choice between modernization and. I want to ask uh, sort of the question that always is implicit in these discussions, of both of you, and that is, if you were sitting with the president of the United States, just the two of you today. What would you tell him to do, Amitai? In the end, we need to ask here. Now, now, tell me, what would you tell the president? I said, Mr. President, the first thing you have to do, as you remember so well from your first inaugural, uh, your acceptance speech, low expectations. <laughs> Don't make the world think that we're going to send them a check or entrepreneurs which overnight will give them the kind of life they see on television. Isn't that uh, what you uh, should have told Bush? Th that's what Americans need to be told in general. The, the danger of inflation is expectation. Uh, the fact is, uh, and I'm sad to report it, but we squander what the limited resource we have when we oversell it to others and to ourselves. The, there is not, we cannot do, uh, bring them to Shanghai, uh, not to mention Switzerland. And so we, we, a lot of people say, oh, we don't mean Switzerland, but nobody tells us what is a good life. And I'm not sure that a life in which you pray five times a day, uh, in which you uh, appreciate modesty and dignity, but not necessarily three TV sets uh, and another car, uh, is, the, is a wrong definition of good life. It's not that I wish poverty on other people and our friends for us. In effect, we need some of that lesson too. We also need to scale back. So, so a life you're, of consumerism. You're telling, you're telling the president, don't raise expectations, uh, but you've got these problems. What are you going to do? What do you suggest that the president Focus does? on a few select issues, oil in Iraq, tourism in Egypt, very limited focus things in which you can do the NASA agenda, in which you can really help them uh, move, like the example you gave from Turkey, it, in the modern direction, but don't imply, it, you can, as um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs used to say, that you can jump to capitalism. Valley. Well, I, I would tell him that uh, uh, you have to be very clear, Mr. President, about what are our interests in Middle East, in different countries, in different ways. But what are our, what are our interests? 
And this is not about it, uh, about our domestic politics of saying, well, you know, we have a we have a deficit to deal with here. We have sequestration to deal with. But you have to be clear and make clear to the American public why does Syria matter or not matter? Why does Egypt matter or not matter? And then think about what is the outcome we want. And it might be, as uh, in Syria, it's nothing close to capitalism. It's maybe stopping the fighting. And why is that important to us? And finally, I would tell him, remember that what we do and say in the Middle East has an implication for how the rest of the world judges our foreign policy. This is not an insular conversation in, in Washington among ourselves. There's an interesting backstory to what you say, Vali, and that is that traditionally the Syrians and the Lebanese have been the entrepreneurs of the Middle East. They have much more, but, but have see, shown it, much more traditional business noose than, than most people. Well, we want, we want to, as, to the extent possible, let that loose. And some countries have more aptitude and more basis for that, and some less. I mean, you can even go to a country like Pakistan, even despite terrorism, there's a lot more capitalism among its middle class than you know you might have in the Arab world. Linda, but, Linda, you're not going to get off. What are you going to tell the no, president? No, I was just going to say, is, is the basic idea that countries that trade together are less likely to make war against each other. But, but you see, the, 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 the issue is, has also moved. See, some of the issues that we were talking about Egypt, Egypt and Amitai was raising is important to one set of countries, like if we were going to help Tunisia or Egypt. But when you come to Syria, this is not the, the immediate question that the president faces or people in Japan or you know, Malaysia or Brazil are watching us. is not about at all about that. It's about you have a you have, some would say that the future of Middle East is being written in Syria in a very ugly, horrible way. Mm. And you have everything that we hate coming out of that. You know, humanitarian crisis, mass killings, uh, you know, brutality, uh, civil war, sectarianism, Al-Qaeda. So the key question for the president is, is not the sort of longer run thing, is that, say, within the next six months, you know, what are you going to do about this? And if, if you're not, then, you know, have you considered what is the cost of inaction? Yeah, and I think said, they're overreaching. Linda, let's hear it. What would you tell the president? Right? My, I think I would tell the president, as difficult as it is, um, we should not abandon the very hard diplomacy that we always did in the Middle East. Yeah. It's very, very difficult, time-consuming, frustrating work. But at the same point, it did yield many fantastic things in foreign policy that I think could be achieved again. The other thing is, I think we better figure out what our interests really are. Maybe our interests are not with Sunnis. Maybe our interests are actually with the Shia, because the Shia have a more homogeneous we're, we're population. We're introducing a new topic here. This is the division in Islam between right. the Sunni I mean, and the Shia. As we're looking the Shia is a minority, although it's dominant right. in, in, but at, in, in Right, in, in, but as in, we're looking uh, at sectarian violence, I mean, maybe it would be worth it to look at, at, at a much closer relationship with the Shia uh, whether they're the Shia in Iran who have huge influence in, in Syria in this crescent that has been formed. Uh, we didn't want it to happen, but it actually did as a result of, of Iraq. And maybe our friends in Saudi Arabia are not so friendly. I mean, a lot of this terrorism that we see has had its birth in, in the Saudi Arabian regime that we tend to prop up all I the time. Just one more word about Syria. Sure, sure. About Syria. Uh, it again is an example of overreaching. One of the major reasons, maybe the major reason, China and Russia are not willing to help us and participate is because we forced regime change in Libya. What started was in Libya a humanitarian help to the rebels. Then there came a point where the rebels were advancing and Gaddafi called for a ceasefire and negotiating a settlement. And then we said, no, you have to go, we want regime change. That is the point where Russia and China, we supported the humanitarian intervention, suddenly said, wait a moment, we don't want you to go and change all the governments in the region, next thing you'll turn on us. In Syria, it's exactly the same thing. We should call for a ceasefire, mm -hmm. for political settlement, and not for a, a, a regime change. Uh, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think, uh, uh, um, you know... Uh, I, I'm glad to hear this. This is a, something positive. Concrete. You would say, call for a ceasefire now, 
stop beating up on Assad anymore. No, no, you, have, you see, that comes, I mean, the point that Amitai makes is, 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 it comes to a point, what is it that we want out of Syria? I think we've reached a point that we want the worst things about Syria not to happen, rather than having a maximalist view of a Switzerland, democratic Switzerland in Damascus. And the worst thing about Syria not happening is that there would be no more refugees, there would be no more al-Qaeda control, and that this thing doesn't spread to Iraq and Jordan and, and, and Lebanon. And I think that ultimately brings you back that, you know, let's just get to a ceasefire, let's stop the destruction of Syria, and that requires a job of diplomacy. So you have to go to the Russians and say, you know, this is, we're not talking about defeating you foreign policy-wise. We can, ceasefire is good for you, it's good for us, how can we get there? And I, I think I have, that's, that's... I have it. to ask, where, where are the traditional Middle Eastern powers of France and Britain in this? Why should this be totally our moral responsibility? It's not Syria. moral responsibility. We're not into this no. at all for morality or altruism. I think we ought to go with view of what is our national interest. Why, you know, if, if the refugees in Syria cause the Jordanian government to collapse, that's bad for us and it's bad for our main ally in the region, Israel. It will make the job of Arab-Israeli peace process uh, even more impossible or improbable. So, so, you know, we have to say that we have to first admit that this is not a moral intervention. We only should intervene, to Amitai's point, to the extent that it reflects our interests. And, 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 and I think that's what the, I would tell the president, that, you know, what is it that we, we want out of Syria? What is our interest? And then how can we pursue it? And we ought to do it in a way that is achievable. We're, as, as I'm we're, out of, we're out of time, and i just like to remind our viewers that the book we're discussing primarily is Valley Nasser's The Dispensable Nation. You can buy it now on Amazon in the usual places. And Hot Spots by Amitai Etzioni, dealing with some of the same subjects. And if I might use the last 30 seconds for myself, I would say, Mr. President, I grew up in the failing final days of the British Empire. Fix America first, so again it is envied as it was when I was a boy, and a lot will come right in the world. We'll see you next week. Until then, all the best. Cheers. House Chronicle is produced in collaboration with WHUT, Howard University Television. From Washington, D.C., this has been White House Chronicle, a weekly analysis of the news with insight and a sense of humor, featuring Llewellyn King, Linda Gasparello, and guests. This program may be seen on PBS stations and cable access channels. To view the program online, visit us at whitehousechronicle.com.